Between the time when the oceans drank Atlantis and before Transformers 3 made 1.1 billion worldwide, there was a podcast undreamed of. A way for two warriors to get together and talk about nothing under the pretense of presenting short fiction on the internet. And on to this, two hosts who wear many failed Parsec nominations upon their troubled brows. It is I, their chronicler, who alone can tell thee that submissions remain closed. And shamefully, the show will never be weekly. Let me tell you of the days of the Doonspeef Audio Fiction Magazine. Behold your hosts, the Dread Big Anglovich and the infamous Rish Outfield. What is best in life, Big? We to have... crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and to hear the lamentation of their women. Hey, that was my line, announcer man. Yeah, that. <laughs> Welcome to the Doing Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 129. I'm Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Welcome, listeners. It seems like it's been a long time, but has it? It was a long time the last time we had an episode, and this time it hasn't been quite as long. But we're back on track, right? Pretty much, yeah. We're back to every 10 days to two weeks. (laughs) That's all right. We're trying. And that's better than you can say for most. It is. There's a podcast that I've been a big fan of for, for years, and they just stopped. A much more prolific podcast than ours they were going good and strong and and had a huge following they had a big upcoming schedule of what they were doing and they missed all of those deadlines and in the forums people were just going crazy hey what's going to happen you know i'm going through withdrawals oh i love you guys so much please come back and the hosts would get on there and say shut up stop (laughs) asking us about more stop it you know what from now on any comments or questions about the next episodes will be deleted by the administrator. And just for the heck of it, I got on the website this weekend and uh, yeah, there they are no more. He had a, like an open letter. He said he could only speak for himself because he was no longer communicating with the co-host. But yeah, all, all those mighty dreams they once had are gone. Huh. Why am I telling people this? Should I put this in the outtakes? <laughs> you could. I don't know. They have pod faded. Yes. Okay. So, but we have not pod faded. No. 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 Quite, quite yet. yet. yet, yet, yet. <laughs> the rumors of our pod fading have been greatly exaggerated. Somewhat. Some, somewhat exaggerated. exaggerated. Yeah. Greatly is probably not the right word. <laughs> so, what are we back with today, man? We've got a story today. The story is uh, one we've been excited to uh, put out for a long time because we're a big fan of the author. The story is called Boxed by Will McIntosh. The Will McIntosh. The one and only. There's no other Will McIntosh in the entire world, it turns out. Well, there is one successful writer. Hugo Award-winning writer, uh, Will McIntosh. That's right. Okay, can you t- give me five interesting bits of trivia about Will McIntosh? Perhaps. Uh, Will McIntosh attended Clarion Workshop in 2003. And since then, he has published dozens of stories, magazines like Asimov, Strange Horizons, Inner Zone, etc. His story, Bridesickle, won the 2010 hugo award for best short story and it was also uh on the list of nominees for the nebula that same year oh the the short list what do they call that the finalist list the short bus oh am i not supposed to be interrupting you no you can interrupt all you want you are a co-host and we're still on speaking terms there's the winner and then there's the nominees i think is what they call them no i didn't we look one time and there's like 600 nominees and and the final winner finalist nominees, right? That could be it. What uh, does it say here? Let's see. Hey, R O eight O T. I have a talk- finalist for that year's Nebula, so it does say that. Okay. What were you going to say about O eight O T? I was going to ask him to edit it out, but oh, okay. Never mind. 
We'll just move on. Um, he has also published his first novel, Soft Apocalypse, in April of 2011. And his second novel, Hitchers, was published in 2012. So if you enjoy this story and other stories which we will mention in the post-show uh, comments, then you should check out his book. I bet you would enjoy that as well. Cool. Today's episode is produced, was produced, will be produced by Renee Chambliss. That's right. She did an awesome job. And Shanky S. Carlo was also, uh, Didn't have I one think he line? was a co-producer. Is that right? Yeah, he was really calling the shots. Renee just does what Shanky has to say. Well, I'm going to give him the story I was going to produce and failed. <laughs> well, there you go. Perfect. Enjoy. Boxed by Will McIntosh. Meta was dying for a cigarette. She didn't understand how that was possible without a body. She hoped the cravings would subside. Fifty-seven years would be a long time to feel that pull. Fifty-seven years. She still couldn't believe someone had discovered her in time for them to box her. She'd been meticulous as holy hell when she snuffed herself, hiked way out to the abandoned amusement park, fucking hiked so no one would discover a car, and got good and lost in the Hall of Mirrors, shot enough god flash to kill a school of blue whales, and woke up in the dark. No, not the dark. You needed eyes to see darkness. In the blank. Some veggie, crunchy, do-good woman just had to choose that particular day to walk her dog at the amusement park. Little Skippy caught a whiff of her trail and ran into the Hall of Mirrors barking like a Baskerville. Skippy found Meta's body in no time because he was using his nose instead of his eyes. It took Miss Fresh Air and Sunshine 20 minutes to get to Meta. By the time she got there, bouncing off mirrors like a squirrel on jolt, Little Skippy was rolling in Meta's intestines, which were strewn all over the floor. She should have stopped reading the transcripts they fed into her e-shunt during the trial, but it's tough to ignore stuff like that when it's about you. Miss Earth Goddess said she could see a thousand reflections of Little Skippy tearing organs out of Meta's still-warm corpse as she scrambled through the mirror maze, screaming, Bad dog! If she'd had a stomach... Meta would have puked her guts out at that. She hoped Earth Goddess beat Skippy's ass good when she got him home. Now Meta's body was repaired, good as new. In 57 years, she'd get it back. Never thought she'd miss the scrawny thing, but she did. She was beginning to develop a bad case of temporal claustrophobia. She'd only been serving her sentence for what, 24 hours? 57 times 365 minus one days to go, with nothing to entertain her but her own weak mind. An eternity stretched out in front of her. Jeez, could she use some god flash. Nothing to occupy her but bones and dust. The bones and dust of her thoughts, her memories, and old Eshunt messages. Meta never threw anything out. Every e shunt she'd ever gotten was still there. She accessed one of the messages at random to see how much time she could kill. Hello, oh, Maida. You or Bo got anything to feed my tubes? Uh, no cash right now, but influx is imminent. Bubby. Oh, that was entertaining. Let's see, what else did she have in there? Ah, classic e shunt from Hee Hee Boy. Dear Deliciousness. I'm sorry if you don't want to hear me say I love you anymore, but I can't help it. I love you, and I always will. I love you, I love you, I love you. I don't understand how you can turn your back on so much love. My heart is aching for you, pumpkin. Please change your mind. I would be so good to you, Jackie. Jackie had seemed like an up guy when they were just e-shunting messages back and forth. An angry, introspective, artsy type, she thought. She pictured him dressed in black, chain-smoking, jolt-laced cigarettes in a dingy coffee shop, always pissed off about something. 
Then they'd talked on the phone, and she found herself on the line with a cartoon. Each time he said something that was supposed to be funny, he'd let out this donkey cackle. <laughs> Goofus boy surprised her by driving six hours to take her out to dinner. Four long, painful hours of... <laughs> When she'd leaned over to pick up the napkin she'd dropped, she'd seen that his legs were shaking. Literally trembling, he was so nervous. He'd wanted her to like him so bad, his legs were shaking, and she couldn't stand him. It broke her heart and pissed her off at the same time. After the date, he sent a torrent of Ishans professing his undying love, even after she told him, nicely, that it just wasn't going to happen. Hold on, could she send Ishans to people whose route number she knew? It would be hard for the pencil dicks who locked her up to disable her capacity to send without screwing up the hardware she was born with. She was sure she couldn't receive, because she would have gotten messages by now certainly from Evie and Grandpa. She'd never be sure if the people she sent messages to actually got them, but she had time to kill, so why not? So, who would be the lucky recipient of her very first unanswerable message? If she were a good girl, it would be Grandpa. But she was not. Hee-hee boy it was. Dear Jackie, how have you been? Sorry, I've been blocking your Ishans for the past six months, but you are driving me fucking nuts with your boy with a broken heart whining. I have to ask, pal, do you have any dignity at all? You'd carry a dead rat to me in your teeth if I asked you to. Do you think that's an attractive quality in a guy? But I've got good news for you, Jackie boy. Here's your chance. I want you back. I'm all yours, mind and body. One catch, though. They're not in the same location anymore. My mind and body, I mean. I've run into a bit of trouble with the law. I'm currently serving a 57-year sentence for murdering myself. If you want my body, it's all yours. Hump it to your heart's content if you can get past security at the cold storage plant. My mind is in a black box in the back of some shelf at the Saratoga Springs Detention Center. Maybe you'd like to come visit it. I'm sure the kind folks here at SSDC would be happy to sit my black box self in a chair across a table from you. Of course, I won't be able to see you, hear you, receive eshunts, or even sense that I've been moved. But you can caress the top of my smooth ebony housing and whisper sweet nothings, if you like. Well, I gotta go. I've got a lot of disembodied drifting to do. Love and kisses, Meta. Maybe this wouldn't be so bad now that she had a hobby. She was sure she'd killed another, what, hour, hour and a half? That only left about 80 fucking thousand more. Meta had read somewhere that prisoners of war pass the time by building houses in their thoughts, brick by mental brick. She didn't know how to build houses, but she knew how to bake cupcakes. She could bake a thousand dozen butterscotch cupcakes... While each dozen was in the oven, she could sit at an imaginary kitchen table and watch an imaginary clock tick off 12 imaginary minutes. Oh, this would be fun. A thousand dozen cupcakes, it turned out, burned a lot less time than she had thought. Maybe those POWs had something with their imaginary houses. Did a cement truck come to pour the foundation, or did she mix the cement herself? It would be nice to have some company, even an imaginary cement truck driver. Then again, it would take more time to mix the cement by hand. She could hire the imaginary cement truck driver to help her mix it. Dear Sweetness, I think about you all the time. It was such a surprise to hear from you. Why would you go and hurt yourself like that? If you could just step out of yourself for a minute and see the meta I see. You are amazing to me. A beautiful heart, a little mysterious, and very yummy. Okay, enough mushy stuff. I have a surprise. 
You're free! Lil Omi stole you from the detention center. Nothing to it. I asked to visit you. They thought I was nuts, but prisoners in minimum security facilities have the right to visitors by law. I swapped you for an identical box. Where'd I get it? Let's just say I got friends in this high-tech world. And stuck you in my backpack. I've reinstalled your eShunt software so we can talk now. We are on the road. Six billion things to tell you. I love you so much. Jackie. Jackie? I'm really out? Thank you. It was hell in there. Get me some eyes and ears, please. Then it hit her. Her body was in cold storage, completely unreachable. And even if she could reach it, even if she could steal it, she doubted either she or Jackie's high-tech friends could access the technology necessary to put her mind back into it. Jackie's reply flashed across her mind's eye. I'm way ahead of you, love. I want to get a few hours out of Saratoga, just in case they discover the switch. Then I'll stop at a pawn shop and hook you up with some eyes and ears. I love you, love you, love you. Meta's first sight through her new eyes was a close-up of Jackie's goofy face. His overbite and weak chin ruined the effect of otherwise gorgeous blue eyes. His long brown hair was tied in the inevitable ponytail. He was wearing a fireman's hat and security guard uniform, the latest fashion among the neo-artsy crowd. She wished she had vocal cords so she could laugh at him. Hi, cutie. Can you see and hear me okay? Jackie asked, his face four inches from the sensor. Put me on the windowsill. I want to see outside. She couldn't feel herself move, but at least now she could see when she was moving. A drab motel room, in Yonkers, according to the phone book lying on the end table, rotated around her. 360-degree vision was one advantage of direct neural sensors over eyes. She saw sunlight, clouds. At ground level, nothing but tangles of barbed wire on a high concrete wall. But it was gorgeous after weeks of blankness. So what now, Einstein? I have no body and no way of getting it back. I've got it all planned out, Ote. Don't worry about anything, he said brightly. Tonight, we're going to celebrate your liberation. First dinner, then I've got us tickets to a play that I think you're going to love. Jackie picked her up. Well, picked up the cube and kissed the end of the neural sensor. He probably thought it was a sexy gesture, but Meta's perspective brought her two fat lips zooming in to kiss her eyes. Ooh, baby. Nothing made her hotter than a chinless guy kissing her eyeballs. Uh, Jackie... Don't know if you've noticed, but I'm a fucking box. I can't eat. Jackie wagged his finger in front of her while shaking his head in time with the finger. Meta, pumpkin, I know in my heart that if you knew me better, you'd love me. I am so good to the people I care about. And I care about you so much. Give me a chance. We're meant for each other. I'm very, very sure of that. Jeez, they'd had one bad date. What was with this guy? If he didn't stop with the baby talk, she was going to puke. Her box felt smaller by the minute. Now, let's get ready to go out. So what are you going to wear? <laughs> oh, I forgot. You've only got one outfit at the moment. That slinky black number... Meta knew it was coming, and she mentally flinched. <laughs> Jackie set Meta on the edge of the table. His wide grin made his teeth bulge more than usual. He was still wearing the ridiculous fireman security guard ensemble. Their waiter came over, and Jackie spoke with him quietly for a moment. The waiter nodded and left. I've got a surprise for you. 
He was going to e-shunt instead of talk to a box in public. As if a man wearing that outfit could make any more of an ass of himself. What's that? The problem with e-shunted communication was that you couldn't convey sarcasm or contempt or disgust. She wished to convey all three in those two simple words. Today is my birthday. And birthdays are extra, extra special days for me, thanks to mi madre. What, is she going to pop out of a cake naked? Now that conveyed the proper sarcasm and contempt. Jackie cackled out loud like he'd never heard anything so funny. <laughs> you crack me up. My mother wanted each of my birthdays to be special events. So she wrote me up a list of 90 foods and never ever let me eat any of them. Jackie pulled out his wallet and produced a folded triangle of paper. He unfolded it and held it so Meta could read it. It was a list of foods, starting with carrots. The first 26 were crossed out. On each birthday, I get to try a new food for the first time. This year, for my 27th birthday, I'm going to try olives for the first time. And I'm so thrilled that I get to share this with you. That means so much to me. I'd kiss you, but the people here would think I'm nuts. Meta was relieved that at least he didn't say hee-hee aloud. She looked around the restaurant. No one seemed to be paying any attention to this strange man sitting across from a cube. Jackie was just sitting in silence, but the other diners had to notice his ever-shifting facial expressions, given that they were about as subtle as a mime's. The waiter came back with a plate of green olives, big ones stuffed with bright red pimentos. Jackie dropped the cloth napkin across his lap and rubbed his hands together enthusiastically. He looked down at the olives, then up at Meta, breaking into a wide grin. Picking up an olive, he looked at it carefully, sniffed it, then put it in his mouth and chewed. His grin faded. The chewing slowed, then stopped. He pulled the cloth napkin off his lap and spit the olive into it. Oh, I don't like them. They're bitter. Last year was peas. I like those a lot better. I eat them all the time now. The best was oranges when I was 12. Those are very good. Meta laughed delightedly in her mind. She was confident that the expression on his face as he chewed that olive would be etched in her memory for the rest of her life. Jackie took a long swig of water, swished it around in his mouth, and swallowed. For the hundredth time in the last couple of hours, Meta considered who she could e-shunt to rescue her from this crazed marionette. The problem was, she didn't have many friends, and the friends she had were unreliable at best. Grandpa might turn her in, she couldn't be sure. Getting caught was unthinkable. No way would she go back to that blank and sightless hell. Best to ride it out with Jackie for now, excruciating as that was. Jackie hiked around Glacier National Park with Meta stowed in his pack, her neural shunt peeking out so she could enjoy the scenery. The mountains were gorgeous, especially the panoramic view Meta got from her neural shunt, but it was hard to enjoy the view with Jackie for company. He was eager to show Meta what an outdoorsman he was. He hiked up rocky inclines, waded through streams, took exaggerated breaths of fresh air. Everything he did struck Meta as contrived. Mr. Mountain Man, exactly how long do you plan on carting me around the country? I mean, I don't want to be ungrateful or anything, but you're holding me against my will, and it's starting to piss me off, sweetums. Against your will? Ouch, that hurts. Jackie put his hand over his heart and stuck out his lower lip. I love you so much, Meta. I can't bear the thought of losing you again. Is that a bad thing? 
She didn't reply, so he tried another tack. I'm keeping you out of harm's way. You're a fugitive, remember? The longer you lay low, the better. The wooded trail they had been hiking suddenly opened onto a gorgeous plateau. A pond glittered in front of them. Wow, look at this! Jackie said, the pitch of his voice rising. He giggled. <laughs> you know what I'm going to do? I'm going swimming! Jackie chuckled. <laughs> Just one chuckle. A speck of foamy spittle flew past Meta's sensor. He put his pack down, taking care that Meta's vision wasn't blocked, and pulled his shirt over his head. His chest was surprisingly hairy, his skin pasty white. Balancing on one foot, he pulled off his running shoe without untying the lace, then pulled off the other shoe. Oh no, not the pants, Meta thought. Jackie yanked his shorts down enthusiastically, exposing a boyish white ass. He whooped. Woo! He was showing Meta what a fun, spontaneous guy he was. He ran full tilt toward the pond, leaping into the air. His feet continued to pump in midair, like a child jumping off a diving board. Meta barely had time to pray the pond was ankle deep before he hit the water, shouting, <laughs> Meta watched and fumed. Have I told you that I've given up sculpting? Jackie sent as he took a sloppy gulp of water. My career has evolved into another medium, pyrotechnic performance art. And that is... His sculpture had sucked. He'd shown her pictures of some of it on their first date, and Meta had opined that it was three-dimensional Norman Rockwell happy crap. You know, pyrotechnic performance art. Jackie repeated, as if emphasizing certain syllables would suddenly make their meaning clear. Fireworks as art. It's the newest thing. Cutting edge. I'm dedicating all my performances to you. Oh, goody. That inability to convey sarcasm was getting in the way again. I rely heavily on the blue twirlies in my performance. I love them. They're so understated yet energetic. I like to create fields of blue twirlies, then set off a white starburst in one corner of the Meta scanned the room, looking for something, anything, to occupy her mind. If she'd had an axe and arms, she would have happily chopped this grinny Disney World escapee into slabs of meat. Their waiter, a studious-looking guy with wire-rimmed glasses, was wearing a bright orange name tag, Orion Cousins. What a perfect name for him. Meta ran a directory search. There couldn't be many people with that name in the country, while simultaneously trying to think of something obnoxious to send him. Turned out there was only one Orion Cousins in the whole U.S. of A. In one swirling lemon sizzler. Jackie had no way of knowing that Meta had paid no attention to his soul-bearing discourse on firecracker art. One of the few advantages to being in a box. Orion came to the table and took Jackie's order. Meta watched Jackie's rabbit-like teeth dance as he talked. Suddenly, she got an idea. A very good one. She sent the waiter an e-shunt as he headed into the kitchen, presenting her as Jackie's girlfriend waiting outside to surprise him for his birthday. Jackie rubbed his hands together dramatically when his quesadilla arrived. Meta laughed uncontrollably in her mind as he carved off a big hunk and forked it into his mouth. He tilted his head curiously as he swallowed. Mmm, this is quite lovely. Tangy. I've never tasted a pea and corn quesadilla quite like it. Wish you could taste it, my little senorita. He took another bite and nodded thoughtfully. It's 
a starburst of flavor. I can't quite place it. Meta knew the precise moment when it dawned on him. His half-full mouth formed a cartoonish O, and his bushy brows formed a cartoonish V. Tentatively, he peeled back one corner of the flower wrap and exposed the medley of spinach, squash, garbanzo beans, and lima beans beneath. Meta was pleased with herself for being able to recall so many different vegetables remaining on Jackie's mother's list. Jackie lurched to his feet, knocking his chair to the floor. Waiter! He cried out. Waiter! The waiter hurried over. I ordered a pea and corn quesadilla. How did these foods get in there? I'm not supposed to eat them yet. When the confused waiter explained about Jackie's girlfriend's surprise, Jackie's eyes got wide. He turned and glared at Meta. You! How could you? Jackie shouted at the black box. The waiter eyed Meta's box and took a few sliding steps away from Jackie. This is how you repay my love, my devotion. I love you! He screamed. Everyone in the restaurant was staring at Jackie, some with forks full of refried beans or cheese enchilada hovering near their mouths. Meta was beside herself with glee. Mommy is probably very angry with Snookums for not doing what he's told. What a naughty boy. For a moment, Jackie looked like he might cry. Then his face went slack. He apologized to the waiter in a flat monotone, handed him a $50 bill, swept Meta off the table, and left. They wandered the dark streets of the city. How could you reject a love so pure? All I ever wanted was to treat you like you deserve to be treated. All I ever wanted is to be with you. Jackie kept up an endless stream of morose self-pity as he shuffled aimlessly, his head hanging low. Jackie wandered into a seedy bar near a river. The walls of the bar were painted as black as Meta's box. The floor was damp, as if things from the river had wandered in earlier for a drink. Jackie downed three neon pink drinks in half an hour, all the while mumbling to himself and occasionally whimpering. Meta was tempted to chide him for ordering cheerful-looking drinks when he was in such a shitty mood, but decided not to press her luck. Mm, sorry, Mommy. Jackie mumbled as he dropped a 50 on the bar and returned to the street. I didn't mean to eat spinach. No spinach till my 33rd birthday. No lima beans till my 38th birthday. He headed back into the heart of the city, Meta dangling from his fingertips, his speech reduced to a monotonous litany of vegetables and ages. Wandering across an overpass, he stopped halfway and looked down at the passing traffic. Tightly packed vehicles roared beneath them. Meta's view of the vehicles suddenly got wider. Jackie was holding her out over the traffic. Meta suddenly realized she might have made a mistake with the quesadilla. Jackie, hun, I'm very sorry about what I did back there. If there's anything I can do to make it up to you. And then she was hurtling toward the maze of headlights below. Above, she heard Jackie scream, No squash till my 39th birthday! A chrome grill appeared in extreme close-up for an instant. Then headlights and black sky alternated like a strobe as she flew end over end. The windshield of a huge truck loomed. Meta heard two cracks simultaneously, one sharp and thin, the other dull and loud, and then she was airborne again. She bounced along the pavement and came to rest in a ditch under the overpass. Part of her view was obscured by a mass of thin lines like spider web. As she oriented herself, she realized the lines were the guts of her box. The black box was in two pieces held together by a webbed mass of thin filament, her neural sensor hanging from one ragged half of the box. She was seriously fucked up. A few feet away, tires hummed by, spitting dust into her already limited field of vision. 
Meta? Pumpkin? Jackie said, startling her. His hands wrapped around each half of the box with obvious care, lifting her. Can you hear me? Are you there? Meta Pigeon, are you all right? He e shunted her. Meta was uncertain whether Jackie would rip her in two or tape her back together if she answered. She decided to play dead. He was too unpredictable. Once he was gone, she could e-shunt for help. Maybe it was time to take a chance on Grandpa. Jackie cradled Meta in his arms and headed up an embankment back toward quieter city streets. I killed her. Murdered her. I'm going to hell. Jackie's steps grew quicker and his tone more panicked. Oh, God, oh, Mommy, what should I do? He started to blubber. (laughs) Meta kept quiet, difficult as that was. Jackie headed down a side street, then cut into a narrow back alley. Quickly and unceremoniously, he lifted the lid of a filthy green dumpster and dropped her in. Dear Grandpa, I am in very deep trouble. I was kidnapped, then dropped in a dumpster, and I don't know where I am. I don't even know what city I'm in. Meta deleted the message. Grandpa would alert the authorities, and if Meta ever got out of this, she would be looking at 57 years of hell. Better to die. All of this had happened because she'd wanted to die, so what would be the tragedy if she was squashed by a compactor in the back of a garbage truck? Though, she had to admit, she'd been feeling better lately and would prefer not to die just yet. She was not compacted in a garbage truck, but she did ride in the back of one, her exposed filament hugging pizza crusts and crappy diapers and used syringes. Most of her life, people had accused Meta of being trash, if they could only see her now. She was poured out at the dump with the rest of the garbage, and after a few hours there, she grew tempted to e-shunt somebody. Anybody. She was buried in trash and barely able to see daylight. Maybe she should try Bobo. No, he was more likely to tip off the authorities than Grandpa, given that she'd poured concrete down all the drains in his house after he told her to pack her stuff and get out. She needed to concoct a foolproof story, then send an emergency e-shunt to someone who didn't know her. She still had that waiter's address. Wires and shit. Computers. Shit like that. A gravelly voice said nearby, interrupting her reverie. How about this? A younger voice, it sounded like a kid's, asked. Nah, 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 stupid. That's from a car. Electronic shit's what we looking for. Meta heard clattering as the owners of the two voices dug through garbage all around her. I get half, the kid said. You don't get no half. I tell you what you get, you get 11%. The man cackled. The hissing clatter of shifting trash was close now. Meta wished she could shout out that there was some real good electronic shit right over here. More light broke through. Then more. The man stood over her with a steel pole in one hand. He was filthy and scrawny, with close-set rat's eyes. The eyes locked on her, and he grinned, exposing cracked brown teeth. Looky here. Now we got us something. He grabbed hold of the filament holding the two halves of the box together and yanked Meta roughly from the pile. Meta's mind went blank with static for an instant as the troglodyte tossed her into a wheelbarrow and proceeded to cover her with more electronics. At least she was moving again. She endured a long ride in the wheelbarrow, not quite long enough to get used to the sensation of bouncing she perceived in the wild jerks of her visual shunt. Finally, the pile of plastic and metal that contained her box tilted hard, and Meta slid from the wheelbarrow into a dark place that left her with only her aural receptors for information. 
She was absurdly grateful when a third voice finally entered her awareness. They seemed to have reached a destination, and the new voice sounded exasperated. Eddie, Eddie, what am I going to do with you? See this? The pile that Meta was in clattered, and a nearby tube slid away. A vacuum cleaner tube is not electronics, and this... More clattering. ...is a toaster. There's some good parts in there. Some fine electronics, buck a pound. And how many pounds do you figure is here, seeing as how we ain't got no scale? Asked the new voice. I can about 50 pounds. Eddie replied, oblivious to the other man's mockery. Forty bucks, Eddie, and don't ask for forty-five. I'm bending over and letting you give it to me up the ass as it is. Appreciate it. For the next few hours, Meta shifted and rolled to the sound of hydraulic machines. She was in a dim, cavernous room, strewn with piles of electronics. The high ceiling was laced with exposed piping and ducts. In the center of the room, a worn-out couch, tables, a TV, a cot, and an avocado rug set off a living space. Meta spotted the tenant at a plywood work table against the far wall, which was laced with wires and seemingly random bits of black plastic. The man was in his late twenties, very tall and very thin, with long black hair and soft androgynous features. The kilt he wore clashed with a teal shirt torn at the elbows. He was doing something electronic. When the big industrial clock on the wall read 10 p.m., the guy stood, stretched his neck a few times, and walked 30 feet to sink into the couch. The TV popped on and scrolled through a menu as he sat with his arms folded across his chest. The gent's furniture might be crap, Meta thought, but the TV was state-of-the-art. No remote, direct e-shunt control. He scrolled to the adult vid section and chose a film called Whips, Chains, Clamps, and Tramps. This guy was more Meta's speed. She suddenly realized that this was her chance. She snapped alert, focusing her attention on the bottom right corner of the TV screen. And there it was, the guy's e-shunt address. You can't rent a vid called Whips, Chains, Clamps, and Tramps without providing your eShunt address and password for age verification. The vid jumped to life. A busty redhead with her hands tied behind her back was led into a makeshift dungeon by an even bustier blonde with a riding crop in her hand. Meta's new owner started getting a little too comfortable. He unhooked the clasp on his kilt and lay back deeper into the couch. Meta was sorely tempted to wait and time her first Eshunt message to coincide with that special moment, but the quesadilla incident had taught her an important lesson. Don't piss people off too badly when you're in a box. Excuse me, but before you get too, shall we say, engrossed in this fine film, you should know that there's a lady present. The guy leapt off the couch and reclasped his kilt, frantically scanning the dark, cluttered room. Meta was reminded of a teenage boy whose mother had just opened his bedroom door and caught him doing just what he was doing. The TV screen went dark. Who's in here? Who sent me that e-shunt? He shouted, a quaver of adolescent guilt breaking through his attempt to sound authoritative. I confess, it was me. Now don't get all indignant and accusing. You're the one who brought me here. The name's Meta. How do you do? Where are you? How about speaking? He started stalking around the room, looking behind the larger pieces of equipment where a person might hide. I would absolutely love to speak, but you see, I have no vocal cords. No mouth either. No ears, no eyes, no legs, no duodenum. I could go on and on. And you're not going to find me looking like that. What do you say we play a little game of hot and cold and I'll direct you to me? The guy smiled, held his spidery hands up in supplication. Fine, Meta. (laughs) This is royally fucked up, but I'll play. Here goes. He started walking away from Meta. Cold. Extremely cold. Your nuts are going to get frostbitten if you persist. By the way, what's your name? 
He spun around and headed in her direction. Marcus, how am I doing now? Warm, warmer, getting hot. No, don't step around that pile of crap. I'm part of that pile of crap. Marcus turned back to the pile and held his hand over it. He moved his hand back and forth. Hot, scalding, you could melt tungsten. He laid his hand on one half of Meta's box. Jeez, you're in a neural retainer? How the hell did you end up in a junkyard? This is unbelievable. He carefully untangled her from the pile and carried her to his workstation, where he picked pieces of trash out of her, then gingerly worked the filaments until he had joined the two halves of the box together. He reached for a roll of tan masking tape. You've got to be kidding. No way are you putting that on me. Marcus frowned. I can't solder whatever this is the retainer's made of. What do you suggest I use? Paper clips? Use the black tape. Have you no sense of aesthetics? Marcus burst out laughing. He retrieved a roll of black electrical tape and wound it around Meta's box half a dozen times. Meta resisted the temptation for weeks, but eventually boredom got the better of her. She liked Marcus, but when he was tinkering with his electronics, especially the odd-looking project that covered part of the wall over his work table, he often drifted into his own world, leaving Meta alone with her thoughts. And leaving Meta alone with her thoughts was definitely not a safe idea. One day, while Marcus was out on a junk run, and Meta had nothing to do but think mean thoughts, the temptation became too great. Dear Jackie, I thought you'd like to know that I'm fine. I'm sure you've been worried sick about me ever since you hid me in that dumpster for safekeeping. Difficult as it was to get over you, I've met a new guy, and we're having non-stop e-shunt sex. Oh, the things I tell him I'd let him do to my body if I had one— Shocking and scandalous. Surprise, you chinless, dickless mama's boy. I'm still alive, and my only regret is that I couldn't remember any more forbidden foods to cram into that fucking burrito. Snuggles and lima beans? Meta. Jackie's reply came almost immediately. You bitch. You evil, evil bitch. I hate you. I'm going to tell the police what I did. I don't care what happens to me, as long as they catch you and take you back to prison. How could you betray me like this after all I did for you? Meta felt a mix of emotions. On one hand, she felt the warm satisfaction she could only get from pushing just the right buttons to send someone into an explosive rage. On the other, she felt a niggling uneasiness that Jackie might actually contact the police. If he did, could they trace the dumpster to the dump, then connect her with Eddie, the inbred electronic scavenger, and finally Marcus? Not likely. You still closing your eyes? You're not peeking, are you? If you don't take this washcloth off my eyes, I'm going to e-shunt the proper authorities and have you arrested for aiding and abetting a fugitive. At least aiding. I don't know what abetting is, so I'm not sure you're abetting. Oh, I'm abetting. Ready? Ready. Is that a sarcastic ready? You need to indicate when you're being sarcastic. How about putting an asterisk at the end of any word or phrase that's meant to be sarcastic? That's a great idea. I'll be sure to do that. Much better. You ready? Surprise! Marcus lifted the washcloth, and Meta's vision returned. She was on top of the coffee table. A cake lit with candles and a package wrapped in brown paper sat nearby. Meta's box was decorated with a black ribbon and bow. Oh my, how exciting. A cake I can watch you eat. Marcus swiped a finger full of icing and smudged a white trail across Meta's heavily taped box. I think the asterisk idea was a mistake. Marcus unwrapped Meta's gift. 
an e-shunt link giving Meta control of the TV, stereo, and environmental system. As soon as it was loaded, Meta cranked some Argonauts on the stereo, while Marcus sprawled on the couch and did some God Flash. We'll figure out some way to get you back in your body. Don't worry about that. Not possible. Yeah, I know. I just wanted to keep your spirits up on your birthday. You may recall my spirits weren't all that high when I was in my body. It's not that important. I'm starting to kind of like the box. There was a thump on the steel door. Yeah? Police! A voice shouted. Marcus flinched. Oh, shit. I didn't want to tell you. I e-shunted taunts to Jackie, and he said he was going to lead the police to me. Hide me! Jesus, Meta. Marcus hissed under his breath. He grabbed Meta and stuffed her into a pile of debris, then answered the door. The interchange was short. Marcus refused to let the police inspector into the apartment to look around, and he denied knowing anything about Meta. The inspector promised to have a search warrant in an hour. He shunted the request to his precinct and camped outside the door to wait for the warrant. Marcus's hand was shaking as he drew Meta from the pile. Meta, what do we do? I'm not going back. I can't go back to that hell. But shit, what can we do? We don't have much time. Should I hide you? They're probably going to sift through every pile. Marcus was pacing around the room, looking frantically for somewhere to stash Meta. I won't go back. You'll have to kill me. I can't do that, Marcus said aloud. It's not your choice. You're not the one who's going to float in the fucking dark for 57 years. Rip open this box and shred those wires or whatever the hell they are. Now, please, you have to do this for me. Marcus stopped pacing. He looked down at Meta for a long moment. Tears welled up in his eyes, and he nodded slightly. Thank you. I don't think I ever said that to anyone in my life. Shit. I finally don't want to die, and now I have to. Meta felt a black dread wash over her as Marcus carried her to his workstation, pulled a razor knife off the wall, and slit the tape holding her together. Tears poured down his cheeks, dripping on the fragile filaments as the two halves of her box separated. Meta braced herself, not sure what it would feel like when he tore her apart. Hold on. He was staring at the maze of electronic guts covering the wall. What? Do you have an idea? Not one that will save you. Meta's rising hopes snuffed out. Well, don't send hold on, then. You don't say hold on to someone who's about to die unless you've come up with a way to save them. I'm sorry. Look, here's my thought. What's holding your mind is partially organic, but it's basically electronic. I'm thinking I should try to incorporate you into this. He gestured at the wall, covered with the intricate patterns of wires and blinking transistors of his tinkering. I have no idea what would happen to you, but it couldn't hurt. What is all this? She asked frantically, wishing she had made him explain it to her long before. There was so much she didn't know about Marcus. She found she didn't want to die until she had the chance to learn more. A little of everything. It hacks into larger networks. It wasn't much of an explanation. Meta considered for a moment, then answered decisively, Do me, stud. Marcus dropped the razor and grabbed a tiny instrument. She watched as he deftly separated a segment of filament, dropped the instrument, stabbed another off his workbench, and used it to join each end of the filament to a different chip or a transistor or whatever the hell the tiny black nodes all over the wall were. Something shifted in Meta. It was subtle and indescribable. Talk to me. I'm scared shitless. I'll miss you. Don't don't mean to be mushy, but I think I love you. 
He sobbed and wiped his eyes with a swipe of his forearm. That's pretty fucking mushy. Marcus laughed, sniffed, and took more filament from between the two shattered black husks. The room receded, fading into black and white fisheye. Talk. Sorry, I'm trying to spread you out so you'll be part of lots of different networks. What are you feeling? Meta never answered. She heard music. Metallic, grinding music that made her teeth hurt. Her body felt like it was back. The room pulled back until it was a tiny dot at the end of a long tunnel. She heard a faraway thudding, then a shout. Go away! She heard Marcus howl from the end of the tunnel. Then there was more thudding. Marcus spit a rash of curses that made Meta proud. She heard louder thudding and screeching metal. Meta felt her arms twist round and round till they popped off. Her head corkscrewed till it flew loose from her neck and spurred it away. The music shifted to a white noise roar, like water bursting from pipes. And Meta, who was not Meta anymore, was carried off in a dozen different directions on waves of liquid static. The police confiscated the empty shell of Meta's box. They had little choice but to accept Marcus's story, that he had found the pieces in a pile of electronics he had bought from Eddie. When they were gone, Marcus sat at his workstation and looked at the maze of electronics, noting here and there where he'd grafted Meta. He gingerly ran a finger along one Meta circuit and smiled. Hope you can find some trouble to get into in there. He dragged himself to the couch and collapsed, staring at the pipe-webbed ceiling. The TV flickered to life. Marcus sat up with a jolt. On the screen, a busty blonde was spanking a slightly less busty redhead. Marcus smiled again and kept smiling. Author's Note I wrote this story a long time ago, before I sold my first story, at a time when I so wanted to sell a story. I remember thinking that if I could just sell one story, I would be happy, even if I never sold another. I wrote Boxed after receiving encouraging feedback from the editor of a now-defunct e-zine in response to a different story I'd submitted. The editor wrote something like, I'd be curious to see what you could do if you wrote a completely character-driven story. So I set out to write a character-driven story. I'm not sure how character-driven Boxed is, but I tried to begin with a strong character. I'm drawn to strong female characters, running the gamut from self-aware, enlightened heroines to terribly damaged women with obvious personality disorders. Meta clearly leans closer to the latter, although she has a strength of will that I hope at least somewhat redeems her. Since I was striving for a character-driven story, I thought it might be interesting to tap this strong-willed, emotionally unbalanced character into a seemingly impossible situation and watch her try to escape. I found Meta interesting enough that I resurrected her, or at least a character much like her, in my novel Soft Apocalypse. She isn't based on anyone I know in real life, thankfully, but the strange guy who is so devoted to Meta, until she became intolerably mean to him, was based on a real person. A good friend, who was the inspiration for the character Annie in my novel Hitchers, dated him a couple of times and described him to me. He struck me as so odd and interesting that I incorporated him into Boxed. Hi, I'm the tie-dye flipster, and there was no part for me in today's story, so I get to do the cast list. Yay! Anyways... Meta was played by Ari Chambliss, who also narrated the story. Bubby was played by Brian Lincoln. Jackie was played by Big Anklovich. Eddie was played by Christopher Monroe. The Junk Electronics Dealer was played by Renford T. Chamberlain. Marcus was played by Rish Outfield. The Police Officer was played by Eric Kenny. And the Kid at the Dump was played by Jean... 
S. Carlo. It's Jed K. S. Carlo. Ah. <laughs> So there you go. We'd like to thank uh, Renee's children for allowing her to produce this episode or allowing her to participate in some small way in the episode (laughs) she produced. Okay, one question before we talk about the story at all. How fun was it to do the voice of Jackie? It was a lot of fun. Do you remember how I described him to you? (laughs) I do. I thought she asked you to perform him. No, that that was my thought the entire time. From reading the story in the first place, I started reading that story and I thought, okay, this is the character I want to be, first of all. You assigned yourself that character? I assigned myself that character. When Renee chose that, I said, okay, here's what I want. (laughs) I had no idea, man. I, I just assumed that uh, you got the wacky character I'm normally given. (laughs) Just because she wanted to see you shine. I don't know if that's what happened, but uh, I said, okay, this is going to be my character and he's going to be... A straight Richard Simmons. That's right. The only reason that he was straight is because he wasn't gay. (laughs) He was basically Richard Simmons. Or at least my terrible impersonation of him, but... I got to hear this several times. I heard it yesterday. I heard it last week when you re-recorded your lines. And I heard it the first time you recorded your lines. I almost re-recorded them a third time, too. Today, right? Yeah. The first time we recorded them, I was so into my character that I was freaking yelling over this mic going, Oh, I love you. (laughs) I love you. I love you, dear deliciousness. I so overdid it that it was just pegging every time I would say a line and it was, you know, overmodulated and sounded terrible. So Renee asked me, would you mind redoing those? And so the next time we got together, we redid them. And that turns out was the day that I had my mic turned around backwards. <sighs> is it possible that this story is cursed? Pretty much most stories that get made on the Dune Steve are cursed. There's others that are in worse cursed shape right now than this one. So we'll have to see. One of them, the Bermuda Triangle, has completely gobbled up the producer that goes with it. So and we'll his to, file, more importantly. Yeah. We'll have to see if he ever resurfaces. I'm afraid that he may be dead. And we might never know if he actually were. Yeah, that's kind of the way it is of somebody that you just know via email. But anyways, uh, off of that morbid subject and back to the story, I, I listened to the story and I, I heard it and I went, wow. That was the day my mic was backwards. Maybe I ought to redo these a third time. And Renee was willing to edit a third time, but... I kind of left it up to you. I said, okay. She said that she thought it was fine because Jackie's lines never came to us through ears. Meta sounds perfect because she's in the box and she's in there. So you'll get her lines normal, but everybody else's lines are going to sound like they've filtered through some kind of electronic something or other. Because it's how she hears them? Emails from people were that way and other stuff like that. And so she thought it was okay that his lines were weird like that. I thought it was okay too. I I guess my sensitivity is toward the performance, toward the the acting, if you will. I don't know if you could call that acting. We're talking... Of course it it was because you are totally not that person. (laughs) Uh, we've talked about it a lot of times, most recently in that interview with J.M. Perkins. you got to put yourself into these things and not be nervous that somebody might laugh or that your family is going to be awakened or bothered by it. Because, <laughs> yeah, I mean, just this character was so flamboyant, so outrageous that you can't, you know, do the whisper shouting <laughs> that right. kids do because they know, you know, they'll get in trouble. Stop it right there. This character, he was so outrageous that you didn't have to worry if people laughed. It actually had to worry if people didn't laugh because that was kind of the point of the guy was to get people to laugh with his utter absurdity and craziness. Now, see, at the point that we're recording this, Will has not sent us an author's note. But I would be curious to know if Jackie is based on somebody that he knew. If if there could possibly be someone like this out there. (laughs) He was a very fun character, and he was—he may be the wildest character that I've done on the show. Can you think of anybody else? That, I mean, I there was that time that you were the devout follower of the Invisible Kingdom guy, and you were just like, "Oh, you are my!" Yeah, remember, and you were just crazy with like 
adulation and praise and worship of this guy. To me, that seemed like a really fun character huh. to play. Yeah, I re- thinking back on wacky characters that we've done, I, I think maybe the cockroach that you did on... Uh, Your kids Earth. still say, welcome to Earth Mart. <laughs> yes, they and do. I and I guess it's just I was so loud when we were recording that. <laughs> that, that I think they heard it a few times in the editing, because if I remember right, that was one that I... We both edited yeah, that Yeah, I think together. you edited the story, and then I put the sound effects on, so they heard it plenty of times, and my daughter will still say that if she sees the picture that went with it, she'll be like, welcome to Earth Mart. <laughs> Seems like oh, I boy. saw a professional drawing... Maybe it appeared in a magazine or something like that, and it was so much better than mine. But it it frustrated me because that's the thing. I'm a perfectionist, and I'd like to go back and (laughs) fix that drawing, despite the fact that it took, you know, an hour and a half to do or whatever. There are just so many episodes where I'm like, oh, I'd like to do that one over. (laughs) Yeah, that's kind of the way things are. But, you know, at some point you got to pull up stakes and move on. So this story is one you sought out. Can you give me the background on that? Well, basically, I liked Will McIntosh stories. Every time I heard a Will McIntosh story, I liked it. And so I thought, you know what? We need to get a Will McIntosh story. And so I started reading any stories that he had and looked for one that would fit our show. And I read several that I liked, but they were perhaps not right for our show. And then I found this one. I said, you know what? A, this one is a good story, and B, I want to play Jackie. (laughs) Well, no, that's the kind of passion that, like Asshat Magic Spider, if you weren't so hell-bent on getting that story, you know, we never would have podcast that story. It took a monumental effort on your part. (laughs) And there are some that are like that, where it's just like, no, I want, I, I, oof. Brian Lincoln, the next story he's producing is one he actually sought out and brought to the table. And when you see something like that, where somebody's just like, I got to do it, you know, it's like when you hear an actor saying, I would have done that movie for free. (laughs) Well, we are doing this for free. Yeah, there you go. But it's the same sentiment, you know? Right. Yeah, it totally was that way. And you, I think, are the same way with Will McIntosh. You told me that you just absolutely loved Bridesicle when you heard it on uh, Skate Pod. Skate Pod. It was up for the Hugo that year. It was, And yeah. they always do the Hugo, the short story finalists, nominees, whatever you call it. Mm-hmm. And that one I heard back when I was really current. And right. it hadn't won yet. And I was like, holy cow. The story really touched me. It moved uh-huh. me. It, it grabbed me. It just made me think and feel, which, you know, the best stories do. And and then it won. And I was like, right on Macintosh. (laughs) And I was just doing a thumbs up. I don't know why it's an audio podcast. Well, that's all right. Now that you explained to everyone that you did that, they know. I mentioned that when I emailed him how much we enjoyed Bridesicle. And he wrote back and said, yeah, thanks for the kind words about Bridesicle. That story changed my life. And, I can understand uh, that, yeah. I'm willing to bet that that Hugo nomination kind of led to him getting Soft Apocalypse published and moving on in a new direction as a writer. So that's that's pretty cool. Now, Soft Apocalypse is a novel, but he's also got a short story called Soft Apocalypse. And didn't you tell me that was one of the ones you read in preparation for uh, obtaining this story? It was, yeah. Soft Apocalypse was... Another one of his more well-known stories, I guess. It was a finalist for the 2005 British Science Fiction Award. It was one of the ones that I read. I I enjoyed it. You can get the gist of the story from the title. It's just the apocalypse is coming, but it's kind of that idea like maybe the apocalypse isn't something that's going to happen. You wake up one day and the world has gone up in flames or... The ice Age has come again, or the zombies are out there now and they're beating on your door and trying to get in to consume your flesh. Instead, it's just a steady step down, 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 down until all of a sudden you look around and you're like, holy crap, it's the apocalypse. You know, the world is over and there's it's too late to stop it kind of a thing. And he just goes through that. All those kind of things are going on in this world and person has to deal with it. It's an interesting idea, and it's kind of when you th- really think about it, it's most likely the way the apocalypse is going to come. You can see even signs of maybe a soft apocalypse starting. You know, people are pulling apart, and communities are coming apart, and people just stare at their phones all day long, and, you know, they don't care for their children like they should, or they don't have relationships with other human beings like they should, or whatever. I don't know. Well, no, you you, you told me that there was a girl... 
that walked in front of a train yesterday because she was reading her phone and her mother said, I understand because it was a really funny text. (laughs) Okay. Well, she died doing what she loved. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah, that kind of stuff happens a lot these days, too. People drive in their car and all of a sudden they just veer into oncoming traffic. Why? Don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised if they just got a text at the moment where they were trying to text somebody else or the phone rang or they were trying to change to the next Lady Gaga song that they liked on their iPod and they you know, had to look down and scroll and all of a sudden, oh crap, I'm in oncoming traffic. Every time you turn on the news, another public figure or the child of a public figure has turned into a Muppet. It is a soft apocalypse, I think. <laughs> That's right, it's coming. But yeah, he's now made a novel that goes along with that soft apocalypse and he's also got a second novel. Hitchers. Yeah, the funny thing is, <laughs> way back when we first asked him if we could do this story, Soft Apocalypse was newly released. And, he's, <laughs> and he said, hey, can you mention Soft Apocalypse? Apocalypse, my new novel? And I said, sure. And now it's not his new novel anymore. He's got a newer new novel already. Well, that's what happens when you don't surf the internet three hours a day, right? I had to try that. I, I wouldn't know. It's probably way more than three hours, <laughs> I'm afraid to say. There, there was another story, and I would be, I would kick myself if I didn't mention it. He wrote a story that was on Escape Pod last year. Was it last year? Yeah. The years fly by. Crazy, man. Yeah, I know. One minute, you're holding your baby daughter in your arms. The next minute, she's a Muppet. (laughs) So (laughs) last year, there was a story he wrote on Escape Pod called Midnight Blue. It was a story about a world in which there were these magical balls Oh, tell me more. This sounds like my kind of story. It, it does sound like your kind of story, but but it's not. Dear Deliciousness, what's this story about? Stop. Wow. Stop. You were embarrassing me and your daughter, Grover Monster. It's <laughs> about a world in which there are all these orbs that give people m- magical powers, like like superpowers kind of thing. And we've gotten to the end of the line where all, almost all the orbs have been used up and Holy pee, my friend. I heard that story and I just, I ached. Why did we not do that? I mean, just, it captured my imagination and it threw it up in the air and it caught it and my imagination went, (laughs) (laughs) it was such a good story. And, And, you know, everybody has stories that they've read that just like open their eyes and it's like, wow, kind of. It was the Avengers of Escape Pod stories. Just I wish that we had run boxed two years ago and he sent us Midnight Blue and we had done Midnight Blue on our show and we gained us a bunch of new listeners. And, uh, you know, he was constantly sending us stories and I was sleeping with that hot returns girl at Target. Oh, yeah, that seems like one event follows the other. So it would definitely go that way. No, I really enjoyed uh, that Midnight Blue story. One of the things that I thought was funny is, you know, he finds the thing. And they can't decide what color it is. Everybody keeps going, is that navy blue? And they're like, navy blue? Navy blue is good whistling, right? That just made me laugh. That's a talent you can get from one of those orbs is to be able to whistle oh, good. See, that's why you interrupted me when I said superpowers. All right. You're yeah, right. it's not there always superpowers. Some, there were some really mediocre yeah. gifts. Some of them were like better looking. And uh, that's a... I could use that. A gift, but not necessarily a superpower. And it was interesting, too. It almost seemed like it was specifically aimed at guys like you and me because it was set back in, like, the 60s. Was it? I thought it was the 80s. It gives you that, like, nostalgia already. It made me think of, like, if Steven Spielberg saw that story, he would be a perfect director to make that film. Get a bunch of kids, go out and do it, just like Super 8 or E.T. or, you know, one of those. Well, you never know. You never know who are listening to those files. I mean, unless it's our show. Then you know that nobody is. That sort of thing's got to happen in the future. Somebody heard a story on a podcast rather than they read a story in a magazine and said, I want to make a film of it. There you go. I mean, the world is changing. Medium is changing. Yeah, it wasn't really. I mean, the show was only good for so long and then they kind of had to do something to it. Okay, I'm sorry. The medium is changing. Thank you for catching that error. (laughs) You know that it's not Escape Pod. Okay, so... 
Will McIntosh, thank you for letting us do this story. And Renee, thank you for producing it so excellently. The story itself, my first impression was this is kind of like the lighter side of Bridesickle. Bridesickle was a story about a woman who had been imprisoned, basically. Her her personality, her soul, if you will, was trapped in a, in technology and that was more like a like a dating game gone awry kind of thing where, uh-huh. where if somebody chose her, she would be released from this right. confinement, from this prison, essentially. Mm-hmm. And people would come, men usually, uh, that were interested in, in, in a woman, and interview her and ask her some questions and then move on to find somebody that's, that's for them. I mean, it, there was something horrible about that. And, and and I just felt so, so bad for the woman in Bridesickle. Right. It wasn't fair what was happening to her. It was one of those stories that just, oh, ooh, I became emotionally involved in fictional characters, which uh-huh. is what the best fiction does. Right. It fools you. These are real people, man. No, they're not fiction. And this one, Meta was... Well, she was kind of a mean person. <laughs> it was funny. I mean, she, you know, you didn't really feel as sorry for Meta. <laughs> she uh, messed with people an awful lot. She, and, you know, she tried to kill herself to begin with. That's why she was in jail. <laughs> but, well, I, it, was, it was lighter. It was meant to be fun, right? I think Help so. Me out. Yeah. Will, was it meant to be funny? He is oh. nodding. I don't know. What were your thoughts the first time you read it? Why did you grab this one and say, okay, yeah, this is the one? Yeah, I read through several and I thought Boxed is the one I liked the best, the one that I uh, responded to the most. And I think it was probably the humor of it, the fun of it that I really enjoyed, the lighter side of Bridesickle of it. I mean, Meta was fun in that she messed with Jackie and Jackie was fun because he was just so crazy. You know, you you kind of wanted to see him get messed with because he was such a over the top freakish dude that you couldn't just take him and love him as he is. You're just like, wow, this guy is what? What was the thing you said? Where what was it you tasted on your? I'm sorry, what was it he tasted on his birthday? Where you're just like, oh, last year was peas and that was so much better. I think it was olives that he had. Yeah, he eats the They're olives. They're bitter. He's like, ew. He starts eating them and he chews them. And then finally, he pulls his napkin out and spits them in. Yeah, he was just a funny character. You know, one of the things that I thought was interesting, too, is just the idea of putting someone in jail the way that they did. Separate from their body. Right. They put them in a box containment unit kind of a thing, and then their body is cold storage somewhere, I guess. And what do they do? You know, you're in this jail. You have no sensory input whatsoever. You don't even have darkness because you have to have eyes to have darkness. You just have nothing. Do you think there's any likelihood that anyone would come out of a prison sentence anything other than utterly insane? Well, that's that's a good question. And her sentence was 50 years, correct? You know, I had a conversation with my friend just this week about that, where we were talking about someone who was so sick, they, they became a vegetable, ostensibly, just waiting to die. Uh-huh. And how horrible that would be, just not even being able to watch the clock, but just waiting And we talked about it and I said, well, would you be able to live in your imagination enough to make that bearable? And and he said, you know, I I don't think we know unless we were in that situation. Right. But I do live a great deal in my imagination. And I think that for a while I could probably make do. Have a whole bunch of friends and adventures and (laughs) long, sordid, tawdry affairs with the girl from the Target Returns booth. Yeah. And it would sustained me for a little while but 50 years holy cow i you know it's hard to even conceive of 50 years of life right we were both yet to even get that far and one of us will not (laughs) i i hear you the idea of no outlet and, and you know just people on an island or in solitary confinement lose their minds right and so i guess we should be grateful that meta yeah, maintained as much of her sanity as she did. She was certainly more healthy than was Jackie. That's true. This story kind of makes me think of that movie Demolition Man. I don't know if you remember that, but when the vividly when the prisoners get sentenced to prison, they went into 
cryogenic storage prison and they were rehabilitated as they froze their years away and uh, when they woke up they had the urge to knit or something like that because that was part of the programming that was being done to them as they slept some kind of marketable skill or something right or or was it just a way to work out their aggression yeah i think it was a channel your energy into this or that which i thought that was pretty funny you know when sylvester stallone's just like why do i feel the urge to knit <laughs> and you know that's uh, totally and I, I don't want to say viable cuz it's still theoretical but you could see you know the way that prisons are overpopulated and right. hell holes and you know they turn a bad person into a terrible person and, and they cost taxpayers money and etc cetera, etc cetera. if you could just freeze somebody for x number of years and say you know you'll go to sleep and when you wake up it'll be time to get out but you will i don't know somehow that seems like less of a deterrent <laughs> i'm tired right now that sounds good <laughs> but, but but with this with your psyche being awake and, and looking around while your body sleeps, but you can't do anything. I mean, it would be like being tied up and you, you have an itch yeah, or right. you know something like that. You know. It's funny. I saw an Onion article just the other day where they said that new graduates were now going to be cryogenically frozen until the job market improved and they were able to get a job as they come out of college. That is good. <laughs> I remember uh, our mutual friend Ian and I once came up with an idea that involved a demolition man style prison but in this particular world the apocalypse had come while this guy was frozen in ah. prison he wakes up and it was the year three i'm sold sir <laughs> that no that's a cool idea how did he unfreeze was it all mechanized or uh, it's just like when his time came the system thought him automatically it wasn't that his time came it was like years and you know like hundreds of years in the future like the thing had broken down but he'd never unfrozen and then one day finally something happened and it most of the prisoners just all died or something like that and he was just the one that the thing managed to work he was actually the bad guy of the story too oh interesting okay but, hey, what expecting a certain answer what became of that story <laughs> Well, it was our friend Ian's story, so it's up to him to take care of that one. Although there have been times where I thought, maybe I should just try and write it myself. Because we actually fleshed it out a pretty good deal at one point. Have we talked a lot about our writing misadventures with Ian on the show? It probably all got cut out. Yeah, I think most of it got cut out. We've, I'm sure we've talked a little, but... But there are scores of <laughs> stories just like that. Um, although usually I don't think you say that they were Ian's stories. It's usually Yeah, usually uh, Ian's more the energy guy. He says, yeah, that's really good. Let's do it. And so we go to do it and then he loses the energy. But he's not always the idea guy. That's more your thing than his. But I really dug that guy. He, he was our bridging friend. I became friends with Ian and you were already his friend. And eventually you and I split off in our own little non- romantic coupling <laughs> our own little bromance and he was in my very very first screenwriting class I, you were too but f you and i i wanted that's to, what even the screenwriting teacher said at that time I, he and i had just become friends and i wanted to impress him and so i named the pizza joint in my <laughs> screenplay fat ian's pizza that the main characters go to thinking that he'd be like wow that's me you know thanks a lot for the the, the nod kind of thing. And it really hurt his feelings. <laughs> That's something that all these years later, I two things. One, he wasn't fat. So I never understood how that bothered him. And two, I have characters go to Fat Ian's Pizza in almost everything. Yeah. I write, anytime there's a pizza place, it is Fat Ian's Pizza, like it's a pizza chain, just because of his reaction to that. <laughs> I, I mean, also, I really liked Ian, but he just didn't, he seemed to think that it was the opposite of that. You know, like, <laughs> oh, the worst girl I ever dated, Nicole Bice, what a biatch, you know, whatever it is. And it's just like, you're, you're putting that out there so that when she watches this movie... <laughs> But it wasn't like that. I think you hurt his feelings so bad that he went out and like became anorexic. He, he exercises constantly trying to stay in shape. He runs marathons now and does yoga and all that kind of stuff. And I think it all stems from fatty and Shoot, pizza. I, I never knew this. <laughs> you could have told me that a decade ago. I Oh, 
Well, I got to give him a call. (laughs) (laughs) He's going to stop exercising once you call him, turn into the actual fat Ian finally. Fat Ian aside, the story that we uh, did today was produced by Renee Chambliss. Who is also not fat. Who is also not fat and also runs marathons and probably does yoga. Wait, what? Really? She is a runner. I don't know. Everybody but me is a runner? <laughs> Everyone that's worth anything is a runner. I, I did not know that. Did you know that, Ed? <laughs> yes. Yeah, she... Well, if you if you read her story, Dreaming of Deliverance, her main character is a runner, and she winds up having to run marathons to save the uh, magical land or fantasy land. I don't know if it was magical per se, but... Put the link in the show notes, would you? Okay. So yeah, you can check that out. Dreaming of Deliverance has to do with that. I think the cover shows a woman running. But anyways, yeah. Speaking she, of Renee. She was going to be on this podcast that's called the, just called the Roundtable Podcast, right? It is. It's not like Knights of the Roundtable or. They round, dance whenever they're able. Roundtable Pizza, maybe. Fatty Ian's going to put them out of business. <laughs> It's the Roundtable Podcast, and it's this show where Dave Robinson and Brian Humphrey, they get an author on there, and the author will throw out an idea, and then Brian and Dave, along with a guest host, will just go after this idea, sink their teeth into it, try and develop it, make it into something that can go somewhere that the author can do something with, maybe offer the author a little bit of help with their story and give them some ideas that they can go with. And Renee decided that because of the nature of the story she wanted to do, that maybe having Rish and I on as the guest hosts would be a good idea. And so Dave invited us over. And yeah, we talked about this idea that Renee had. And we had a lot of fun going through this and talking about this idea. And that podcast, it's airing this week. It may well be now available by the time this comes out. And so as soon as it's available, I will put a link in the show notes. If that happens a couple days after our own show comes out, then it'll be a couple days later. But most people don't listen to our show until a week after it's come out anyways or so. so. Is that true? I don't know. The thing that I dug about it, I mean, they, they, they do a good job over there. They've done several episodes and they have various writers on and various guest hosts on. Like Brian Lincoln was a guest host just a couple of weeks ago. Right. Um, but the thing that was really cool to me was just like that everybody in the room was very creative. Yeah. And they were kicking around ideas and saying, well, what about this? And what if this happened? And he's like, oh, oh, what about this? And it reminded me of when I was in college or I was in a group of of really creative people. Like we had a writer's group in Los Angeles that I would go to. And you'd have people there who wanted to write for a living and, and they become so passionate and somebody have an idea and you'd want to jump in and, 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 and something that somebody said sparked a creative idea. And sometimes I'd go home and I'd be so energized by what people had said. And it was a great experience and it had ha- hadn't happened for a long time except for with you because I've had other friends that wanted to write or were creatively inclined, but life tends to grind you down it really does it just it it wears you out and eventually you're like well i put that kind of stuff behind me that and parasailing and to have five people that were all just part of it was how great her idea was but to just be able to talk there were times when one of the hosts would be talking and i'd just i'd be (laughs) red i wanted so much to jump in but it wasn't our show you're sitting there wiggling like you got a freaking pee your pants or something over and i'm just like man dude it's the bathroom's just down the hall they won't miss you i'll ask renee sometime or heck you can if that conversation was helpful to her at all because she had i mean i've listened to a couple of the episodes where people have a novel in progress and maybe they're having trouble with the ending or whatever. And people will toss out suggestions that change the entire nature of the novel. And I realize that doesn't help them Uh because they've done all, I mean, maybe it is, maybe there are people who've got a novel four fifths done and they'll throw all that out and start over. But oh, it would break my heart (laughs) if that happened. Right. But you know, I mean, they, they need one little area to focus on. And 
with Renee, she had her novel and then she had an idea for a spin-off project kind of thing. There's any number of ways she could go with it. And, and that's another thing that's so interesting about like that we have our broken mirror story contests where you just you have an idea and it can go in any number of directions and some of them will be great they'll they'll reach totally different destinations but they're still good stories and that to me is a a really cool thing about the creative process i don't know i mean how many it's hard to say because i instantly go to movies (laughs) but dracula movies or tarzan movies or zombie movies or, or whatever it is where it's the same idea, but it's been done a dozen different ways or a hundred different ways, you know, a R- Romeo and Juliet or something like that. It just depends on what the person decides to do with the project. That to me is really neat. And it was great to be with creative people again. Yeah. And so I would suggest if you're creatively inclined or, or, or whatever, to go over and check out that show, the round table podcast, it's a lot of fun to listen to and just to hear people throwing out ideas. And, and if you're a fan of Renee Chambliss, for one, you know, you could get maybe a little bit of a preview of what's upcoming that she might have for you someday. How come she's never sent us a story? Because she writes novels. Okay. Okay. So uh, what is that? www.roundtablepodcast.com? Right. Yeah, d- that's it. And there'll be a link in the show notes so you can go check it out. Well, thanks for listening, folks. We're getting here to the end. Um, no, no. We've passed the end a long time ago. Oh, good. Good. But but, but since we've already gone over, oh, uh-huh. um, uh, the word Dune Steve. Oh, uh, okay. I, I, I've gotten a couple of emails from... Okay, I sent the emails myself. But they've been asking what the word Dune Steve means. Well, it turns out we named the Dune Steve podcast after a famous uh, a man in history. His mm. name was Douglas Ian Dune Steve. Okay, and, and, and what did he do? Well, he was a Welshman, uh-huh. and he came up with Pull My Finger. Oh, That man changed my life. Your life has been changed many times. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening, folks. See you later. Tip your waitresses. <laughs> So, hey, thank you, Renee, for producing this story more than once, for nearly producing it thrice, (laughs) and uh, all the people that lent their voices, all the people that donated to ensure that I would suffer through Battleship, (laughs) or or not. If no one donated, thank you as well. And thank you for listening all the way through the end of the show. That's right. Thanks for listening, folks. Have a good time, a good week. I was going to say a good week, but it may be longer. Well, hey, just ask yourself, why not? Hey, there's something I haven't heard in a while. Why not? If you enjoyed today's episode of the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine, please drop by iTunes and give us a five-star rating. We'd be eternally grateful you did. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. Is that correct? If you say so. <laughs> yeah, I'll get it. Take two. There was a story he wrote on Escape Pod called Blue Midnight. Midnight. Midnight Blue. In Paris. Blue. Blue Velvet. Yes. Blue Moon. Blue Monday. <sighs> I don't Stormy care Monday. if Monday's black. Tuesday, Wednesday, heart attack. Thursday, that was Friday, never I'm in looking love. Looking back, it's Friday, I'm in love. Sorry, go on. Saturday. Wait, sing along. Okay, so all that's gone. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. Bum, bum,